the human experience is breaking into the social media content strategy stratosphere as we welcome our guest, best-selling author, journalist, marketing consultant, and speaker, Chris Brogan. Chris, welcome to HXP. So thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. So Chris, uh, just for the people that don't know, what is your background? Uh, well, I have done a bunch of different things. I've been an author. I've done a lot of marketing consulting with mostly bigger companies like the Fortune 100 and 500 types for a while. And then most recently, I've been working with uh, very specific individuals and owners to help them figure out what they need to do to make their businesses better. So lately, that's been helping them with uh, content marketing and lead acquisition strategies and whatnot. But I've handled a lot of different things along the path. And that's, I guess, probably part of the fun of doing what I do. So let's let's just dig right in. How how can we optimize content and community to build engaging social media campaigns? So I never think in terms of social media or campaigns, but what I think of with regards to content is that it's got to serve both sides. So if it's if it's based for marketing, it's you know there has to be some sort of business value for what you're trying to do with it. But then secondly, it's got to serve the people that are you're hoping are going to read it and consume it. I think a lot of the content that's getting put out there right now is junk. I think that there's just so much you know stuff just to be put out there just to be uh, considered technically published that doesn't serve anybody. And so I think that what needs to happen is that once you know the particular community or space you're trying to serve, give them something useful, give them something that they can do or something that will help them improve their capabilities or their connections. Uh, And then in the process, uh, get just a little bit further down the road of earning the opportunity to sell or be of service of some kind. And so I think that a lot of people, what they're doing right now is they're just typing to type instead of thinking, "Hmm, what can I do that would help the people I serve? do something better or improve their game in some way. So how how exactly would we do that? Let's get into that. Uh, I mean, I guess it would depend on who the person is. So, I mean, if you are working in a community, let's say that you, uh, I had a guy who runs a pawn shop and I, he wanted to know how he would make content that would be of value. And I said, well, think about people going to pawn shops to buy. They'd go in to buy maybe musical equipment or something. So how to start a band for under 300 bucks. He goes, oh, cool. Um, how to start a photography career when you don't have the money. And then, you know, basically how to buy the gear from his pawn shop. So basically the end product of everything he was going to say was, you know, and you can get this stuff at the pawn shop. But technically someone could walk away with the information that they needed to do what they wanted to do with or without him. And I think that that's kind of the the gold standard of knowing that people can use the information with or without actually buying your product or service, then they're going to get somewhere with it. So you have to have something specific to sell. How do you think trust plays into this process? Trust is pretty important because a lot of people are used to being either treated like they're somebody else's sales product or they're used to being uh, lied to in some form or fashion. And I think that a lot of people out there are uh, just sort of phoning it in and not really thinking it with a mind of service. And so we we really have to do a lot to get past that. Plus, the other thing is that once we're dealing with somebody in the online space, for instance, we're losing a lot of the opportunity to uh, the things that we do in face-to-face, which includes eye contact, which includes body language, which includes tone of voice and things like that. We suddenly have to just rely on a bunch of digital markers to get there. So, for instance, if your uh, site doesn't have a very obvious and clear about section that talks about who creates or puts together everything that's going on, if you are, uh, if there's not a lot of pictures on your site for people to understand who's behind the story and who's, you know, who they're addressing, and if the if the people aren't in any way accessible, uh, besides through that content and you know purely for that sales purpose, then it's going to be a harder uh, level before someone says yes, I'm going to take an action and do something with them. Is there is there something game changing that you've seen that has completely redefined the success of a business through maybe content creation online? I I don't think with that level of bombast, I would say that there's a lot of times where people can make really good and useful content that serves them. I just saw a good piece the other day from this company called Bench that does automated um, accounting type software. I mean, there's probably nothing less interesting to write about than automated accounting software. So they decided, here's a bunch of different things that you should have already automated by 2015. And if you haven't, take the time and do it now. And one of the products was theirs. And I mean, you knew it was theirs. You knew it was by the same company that you just read the ad for. I mean, the article. But because they'd also given you other things to think about during the article, I sort of felt like, wow, that's pretty cool. So they gave me a lot of things to think about. And oh, by the way, theirs is one of the solutions. It seemed like a good model. 
So what would you what would you suggest is something that people should avoid completely? I'm I'm pretty tired of numbered list posts. I'm amazed that so many people are out there doing that. I think that people using their social platform to recycle a whole bunch of other people's quotes is pretty lame. I don't know that anyone's out there going, man, I hope there's some inspirational quotes on Twitter today. Um, <laughs> and yet, and that's what people are stuffing in there. So I get it. Sometimes we're moved, we're motivated, we want to put a quote out there. But if you're thinking that's what seeds the ground you know, to make fruitful business transactions, it's just not true. I mean, think of any other work environment where you, you would walk in and see somebody just aimlessly quoting information into the air. It's just not really that helpful, I don't think. So I think there's a lot of things to stop doing. Stop treating people like they're a wallet. Start thinking that maybe there's ways that you can serve them and through that process get more stuff done. I just think that at the end, if we're not working from a mindset of service, then no one's really going to profit. So what was what was one of the personal hurdles that you possibly had to overcome in your rise to success? I think I have hurdles every day and every week. Uh, sometimes it's the constant struggle to make sure that I say no to as much as I can so that I can say yes to the people that I serve. A lot of times it's trying to avoid the traps of just doing redundant things. I think that sometimes we chase too many opportunities as opposed to serving the people that we think we can help the most. And anytime we go afoul of that, we sort of waste up a lot of time. I think another hurdle is just trying to do what you think people want versus what you think will serve people from your most I don't know, pure self, you, that, that thing that you really know how to do and that you can really help somebody do, that's where you should stick to your knitting. Hmm. So, I mean, if, if I'm trying to build content and I want to be successful, which hopefully people who are listening to this podcast are hoping to be, I mean, what's that one thing, that sort of golden rule that you've seen repeated over and over that kind of applies and that you could suggest to people? I guess I'm forever amazed that so many people want to copy other people. I think that, you know, I, I can tell you that copying pretty much never gets anyone anywhere and that you just become part of the same pack you just try to get past. So I think the one thing to go after is find a way that you can express yourself exactly the way you feel and to the people that you really wish that you could be addressing the most. And even if you're not necessarily there, you can get there. I mean, if you're, I don't know, really passionate about cars and that's your whole life and you've figured out a couple different ways you can make business out of that, like, I don't know, detailing or accessories, accessory aftermarket sales and things like that, then talk to those people very specifically and forget all the other people and, and stop trying to copy the other voices that are out there in the space because, you know, once you're the next in line, then you're not first and no one's paying attention anyway. Does it does it matter? Do you think it matters how many people are following you on Twitter or how many people are actually sharing your content? I think neither. I, I think that, you know, I've checked with my bank and neither one makes me money. So um, I can tell you that the amount of people following me on Twitter as it's gone up, the value of Twitter has gone down. So I'm at 307,000 followers. I have less engagement than when I had 50,000 followers. So I can tell you that you know, that place has changed because so many people are flooding it with robot content that it just doesn't pull the way it used to. So instead, what I'm always looking for is where can I do the, the best to get somebody to give me access to their inbox via my newsletter because that's the, the still the place where the most effectiveness happens. So I'm always just trying to wait to, to earn a way to somebody's inbox and keep the trust up that allows me to serve them from there. I mean, you, you've talked a lot about standing out online, the secrets to doing that. I mean, how, how would we do that? How do I stand out? Like, I, I mean, I'm running a podcast. How would I stand out from other podcasts? Stop listening to the other podcasts, stop using their format, stop using all of the things that you've heard somebody else do that said, you say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Stop. Because no one else had that format before and no one else will have it after. And their show isn't any better or worse than yours. But the minute you start you know, using their model, then you're playing their game. The book I wrote in 2009 with Julian Smith, Trust Agents, the first rule we gave people was make your own game. That way you're going to always be number one at it. So the fact that, you know, there's John Lee Dumas with his entrepreneur on fire model, that every time I see somebody copy that interview style, it smells like that interview style all the way through. John nailed it. No one else can do that again. So now you pick some new method. Um, I think that the more we stick to formulas, the more we try to work from a formula, the more we're going to fail. I think that there are things that are supposed to be a formula and then there's everything around it. Coke 
is a formula. The, the, we should never mess with the flavor of Coke. And every time we do, no one buys it. But what Coke then insta- instead does is they expand on how do we now apply this in a way that's more and more interesting or more useful or whatever. So that's the trick. You know, Keep the pieces automated that should be so you can focus on making the extra value and the extra flavor. You wrote a book called uh, The Freaks Shall Inherit the Earth, Entrepreneurship for Weirdos, Misfits, and World Dominators. I mean, what was the message that you were trying to get across in that book? That you don't have to be two white guys shaking hands over a boardroom table. That you can be anybody. And as you know, once you figure out who you are and what kind of weirdo you are, then you're going to find the other weirdos out there that are into what you're into. If you're really into Dungeons and Dragons, you can find a way to make that into a business. Um, in, the, in the universe where the top 100 YouTubers, a good majority of them are actually just sitting around playing video games and making jokes while they do it, it's an interesting space because it tells us that you know, the 80 plus billion dollar video game industry is co- is giving enough people a way to live compared to the $20 billion film industry. And yet we still don't think in the mainstream that it's as interesting. So to me, there's just so many pockets of great value out there. And all you have to do is just choose to be who you really want to be instead of a copy of somebody else. So are you, are you of the mind that you should follow your passion and the rewards will come from that? Nope. I think you should follow service. Um, there's a lot of passions that don't really benefit anybody else besides themselves, and that makes them masturbatory. And it feels good, but you don't get fed. So you have to find ways to be of service. Um, you know, If you could be passionate about something where you can also be of service, then you've got the magic. But it, it's never just you know passion because that can land you into some corners that don't really help anybody. Hmm. Interesting answer. So um, any tips for any kind of daily life routines that you use uh, for writing? Uh, for writing. So yeah, I write 2,000 to 4,000 words a day, depending on if I'm working on a book or not. When I am working on a book or not, I always work through the idea that sit down every time I can, make as much time to write as I can, and always practice. The reason most people are bad at writing is that they don't they don't practice it daily. I'll say, well, when was the last time you sat down and wrote? And someone will say, well, I, don't, I can't find the time. Well, we can all find the time. It's always a matter of deciding how we prioritize our time. And so to me, it starts with figuring out how to write 250 words a day, then 300, then 500. And even if you stopped at 500 a day, you know, a, a typical printed page is 250 words. All you have to do is that 500 words times X number of pages, and you'll have a book every handful of months. Most people just don't actually have the discipline to do even that. And that's why no one gets their book done that they've been thinking about for years. So, I mean, how do you keep the pace going? I mean, how do you keep everything alive and fresh and, and new? Um, I, it's, it's a lot like, you know, water in a stream. If you're, if you're working on ideas all the time, if you've got all kinds of questions, if you're, you're paying attention to the people that you're serving and answering what they need, there's always stuff that has to be done. There's always information out there that people are looking for. Where people don't have it right is that they're not connecting to any particular community. They're just sitting there thinking, hmm, maybe I'll find somebody or, or they're living in their own head or they're just reading a bunch of blogs and listening to a bunch of podcasts and going, I hope I can come up with an idea. Well, a blog and a podcast is the synthesis of somebody else's idea already. So it's like saying, I want to go to the um, uh, Target and I want to buy some shirts off the rack and I want to go sell those shirts. Well, all you're doing is reselling somebody else's junk. You've got to get a little further up the stream where you're designing and you're making the fabric and you're putting it out there. So a lot of times when people say they don't have enough ideas or they don't know how to keep it fresh, it's because they're just sitting around consuming other people's instead of going out and making ideas bigger. So then what do you recommend for inspiration? I mean, how does a person reach a state where they're not borrowing another person's idea or kind of stealing content? Stop reading and stop listening. That's number one. It's it's amazing how many people are reading like a couple hundred blogs a day and saying, oh, it's really weird. I, you know, all these, I want to write like Pat Flynn. I want to write like whoever, Lewis Howes, all the different people that somebody thinks that they want to be. Instead, go find people and serve them and see what they're talking about. I mean, I just had a conversation with somebody that they were asking me, how do I, you know, how do I participate in a better way? How do I make that, you know, how do I make it clear that I'm trying to, make my business work better. And I said, well, it's really interesting. I just watched a documentary about professional wrestling and I learned this term called doing business. And what that meant was that 
in professional wrestling, the, the fights are somewhat determined. Everyone knows how they're going to end and that's planned ahead of time. But you, you choose how you're going to execute on that. And if you liked the other fighter and if you respected the other fighter, then you would make sure it went exactly the way it was going to be best for the entire organization. And that was called doing business. And so I found that really interesting inspiration from something as weird as a documentary about professional wrestling. I sure don't find inspiration by reading somebody else's blog because they're already synthesizing the same ideas. So you got to go way outside your uh, circle to find all the good stuff because it doesn't come from that place of everyone else looking at each other's stomachs. Do you think it has to do with kind of moving outside of your comfort zone and getting, getting out there and kind of actually finding yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, the only way we're ever going to find ourselves is as, as we relate to other people anyway. But that means not as we relate to other people's perceptions, but as we relate to the world around us. I mean, I've said it a bunch of times in this interview that service is really important to me. And by that, I mean, who can you go out and help? And in the most basic of ways, can I bring you a glass of water? From these things, bigger stuff happens. It's, it's never from something especially revelatory. There's never some loud thunderclap and then, you know, you suddenly have two plates in your hand that God gave you. Instead, it's that you just poured somebody a drink and thought, you know, if I could pour more drinks, I could get more value. And that's where the big stuff happens is in the little stuff. Hmm. Very interesting, man. Um, you know, I, I know that you run your own podcast. Is there anything that you've learned from all the guests that you've had, had on I've learned to have never an agenda, never a set of questions, always just listen as closely as I can and hear where they're taking me. And then I take their last question and put it to the next question, you know, so that they're not never following some script in my head, but instead I'm trying to find where their journey is going to take me. And I find that what's great about that is I always end up someplace I didn't expect I was going to be. And then it, it makes the, the practice for me uh, in how do I surface the things that are going to make this person shine to the community that I'm putting them in front of? And then what can I do to make sure that the community I'm putting them in front of realizes just how important this person is to their potential growth? So what I'm thinking of it is like an introduction and so that the person will get to be known. But that almost never comes from a set of questions. It almost always comes from figuring out what makes that person amazing and giving them the chance to play into it. Cool, man. Well, um, I know your time is short and I, re I really appreciate you being here. Is there a place that people can find your work? Easy peasy. Go to chrisbrogan.com, grab my newsletter. That's probably the best place to start. Well, thanks so much for your time, Chris. Really appreciate you being here, man. My utter pleasure. This is The Human Experience and we are signing out. Thank you so much for listening.